You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present Tears of the Devil by John Fryer with Nigel Peaver, Richard Graylin, Jeff Bainham, and Robin Ingram as the banker. The play is set in a fictional White House in the early years of the 21st century. Episode 3 One out of every four barrels produced, Mr. President, is burned here in the good old U.S. of A. But we are only finding one new barrel to replace those very four we have just burned. Twenty million barrels a day are used in this country, 140 million barrels a week. That's 7,040 million barrels per year, just to keep the American dream alive. But take away the oil. People are going to starve across this planet, the likes of which will make the famines of the 1980s look like nothing. Without cheap oil, the USA will simply cease to exist. Imagine, if you will, the depression of the 1930s and then multiply its impact many times over on a global scale. That's the future, Mr. President. And there is nothing any of us can do to stop it. The USGS says we have 2.1 trillion barrels of oil left on this planet. Hell him. We don't have much time. The United States Geological Survey calculates their figures along the lines of found and estimated, not known for sure. How far out are the figures? 1.5 trillion are in the... We hope to God they're out there, but we haven't found them yet, Category. That still leaves a trillion barrels to fuel the world. And the world uses one billion barrels every 12 days. How long? Provided demand does not increase by more than 2% per year. Well, that's already happening. 2030. After that, oil prices will be so extreme that only the wealthy will travel on our roads. Over the next generation, congestion will get a lot easier on our freeways. That's what the tax cut was for in 2001, wasn't it? Yes, Mr. President, it was. The nation's wealth was given away, and combined with future oil price rises, when oil is $200 a barrel, this country will experience a recession leading to a depression the likes of which our grandparents could never have imagined. Almost all the oil fields on this planet have passed their peak of production. After that point, the oil price will continue to increase. Costs will be passed on to business, who will pass it on to their customers. Who will be thrown on a welfare as the nation tries to pay off the debt for the 2001 tax cut, huh? Crime rates will increase, the prison population will rise well above the current three million, and corporations will continue to use prison labor to cut costs and improve profit levels. (laughs) How am I doing? Sounds about right, sir. How long before the oil peaks in the Middle East? 2011. And, as we both know, after that, slowly but surely, day after day, the cost of production will increase steadily well above the price that can be sold at the gas stations. The cost of transport will rise, and subsequently so will everything else in this country. By 2030, the modern world will be reduced to candle power. We're simply trying to put off the inevitable for as long as possible. Which is? The breakdown of society. When people will kill their neighbor for the last can of beans they find in the local mall. That's why the previous administration went after the Iraqi oil. They understood the future only too well. I'm afraid so, Mr. President. Those countries without access to reliable supplies of oil will simply... Go to the wall. Rubbish. You think so, Mr. President? Then let me tell you, oil is in the fibers of the clothes you wear, the chemicals that protect the food our children eat, the wrapping that keeps our meals fresh, the plastics that form the covering of every piece of technology that you have ever owned, 
and the power to take you from A to B and back again, as well as the energy which runs our power plants that produces the electricity through which the world we know works. Think about that, Mr. President, before you decide to take the, the moral high ground. What fuels our power stations? Coal, which produces CO2 emissions, gas that will be gone by 2040, and oil. No oil, no electricity. No oil, no plastics. No plastics, no credit cards. No computers, no oil, no domestic appliances. No medical apparatus. No oil, no electricity. No schools, no electricity. The lights across this country will go out. Electricity is produced by burning oil. Mr. President, by burning oil. Syria has 5% of the world's oil supply, Mr. President. 5% that is not owned or controlled by OPEC. OPEC screwed us once before in 1973 over the oil crises. As the oil runs dry, they know we will have to pay whatever they charge us. Whatever they charge us. But with our control of the Iraqi oil, and shortly the Syrian oil, we will hold the balance directly of 16% of total global production. We will decide whether the price per barrel goes up or down. And we will bring it down, Mr. President, forcing OPEC and non-OPEC countries to compete with each other for who can produce the cheapest product on the face of the planet. For years, OPEC squeezed oil to keep the costs high. Now we shall overproduce to keep the costs low. Saudi Arabia, that once had the lowest production costs in the world of only $1.50, now carries 17,000 princes, a burgeoning population, and a generous welfare state. They can't afford to sell on the open market for less then $26 a barrel, and we are going to force the price way, way below that level. The Arabs and then the rest of the world are going to learn the true meaning of respect, Mr. President, for you, for the White House, and for America. That is the future, sir. Bring it on. Any further questions, sir? No. Leave the orders on the desk. Mr. President. Yes? You'd better put Mr. Griffiths through, please. I have a friend who's told me that four Americans were on this British oil tanker. Oh? Yeah, four CIA operatives. So? You don't think this adds something to our case in the eyes of the international community? The agency hasn't, won't, release the names. I'm hardly surprised about that. Neither should you be. Well, then how are you going to use it? We can't use it. Did you know about this? Yes. You didn't feel like sharing it? We had a team in the Sudan. Does that surprise Not you? Not within itself, no. But? What were they doing on board that ship in the first place? Returning home. And chose that form of transport? Yeah. I guess those are the brakes. Yeah. Okay. By the way... Yeah? I didn't catch your friend's name. I didn't give it. I can now confirm that a large number of B-52 bombers have already left for the Middle East. The Pentagon has given no further details at this time, but the belief is that they will join a combined attack formation of about 300 coalition aircraft against Syrian defensive targets. However, with such strength on the side of the Allies, it is difficult to see how the Syrian capital of Damascus can possibly protect itself against an onslaught of 21st century technology. But as negotiations now appear to have completely collapsed, Combat is now seen by many as unstoppable. This could well be the start of Operation Deliverance.
Mr. Sterling, even at this late hour, I must warn you against your current course of action. Oh, and why is that? If you undertake to attack my country, my president will have no choice but to order our military to use all weapons available against your forces. Cut to the chase, Mr. Ambassador. We will deploy chemical weapons against your soldiers, Mr. Secretary. I think I have put that as plainly as I can. Then, Mr. Ambassador, let me speak plainly to you. If you should deploy such tactics, we will not hesitate to launch a nuclear strike against your capital. Is that plain enough for you? I urge you, Mr. Ambassador, to reconsider your proposed defensive position while you still have time. Although I should tell you, you don't have much of that left. You know what we want. And you know what refusal will cost you. Good night, Mr. Ambassador. Ancient Egypt, the long dead might of Greece, Empire of Rome, the strength of the French, conquest of the Germans, the commercialism of the British and the ideology of the Russians. Each of those societies expanded and spent more and more on their military until the center became weak and crumbled. Every year we increased defense spending to combat enemies that always appear to be waiting just around the corner. How would we keep this country going without their compliance to fight and die for the sake of our economy? What would we do if they all decided to live in peace? Who would we fight? How would we keep the money flowing? How could we put off the inevitable collapse at our center? Nuclear war is a game that must only be played by professionals. Wars between nations were sadly rendered impossible with the creation of the atomic bomb. That is why the wars in the later part of the 20th century were small, regional or civil. We have Robert Oppenheimer to thank for that. The superpowers were no longer in a position to directly attack each other with atomic weapons, and it wasn't that they didn't want to. Several world leaders have lusted after the notion of destroying the other side from all political ideologies. No. We in the banking community simply refused to provide the money for wars that would leave no survivors with which to pay back the cost of such a conflict, as well as the interest we would demand. The result was safety for the world, not because of the fear of mutually assured destruction, but because it could not financially afford to destroy itself. In that scenario, there lies no profit.